No, my hi, my. Uh, welcome to our Operations and Monitoring Committee meeting. I'd like to particularly note that in an earlier part of the meeting, we began with 70 seconds of silence for each of the years of our late departed Queen. Um, and we did begin with a public excluded item, which we took at the start of the meeting. So we now move to item five, which is non-financial performance report. And our strategy manager, Lex Verhoeven, will speak to that. Oh, I'll do that next. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, councillors. Really don't have uh, anything too material to add to the report, but perhaps just a comment. Um, I was described the council's performance in the last year. I'd be substantially on track, I think would be fair, um, you know, in what's been pretty challenging operating environment, and I probably don't need to tell you how much is on at the moment. Um, so that would be my, my one comment, um, and just to note that this information's draft, it's currently being audited, and it'll come to you again um, as part of your annual uh, report adoption. Um, I think I'll just leave it there, Madam Chair. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Chair yeah, Hazelhurst. Um, thank you, through your Chair. Just a question on uh, the first page, Economic and Community Development. Uh, the not achieved area of 44%. Could you just explain a little bit about that, uh, that statistic? Thank you, Lex. And I have another one as well. The note two under levels of service. Yeah, so I'm not achieving things there related to um, there's going to be the around um, that's the thing there. Some of these need to stack on to there and maybe we'll get on to that as well. Oh, sorry, can we please ask you to turn on your microphone? Oh, sorry. Haven't been here for a while. <laughs> 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 the uh, one, one of the measures not achieved, I was just explaining, is uh, we're going to target around um, completing a structure plan every year. But some of these measures, just by the nature of them, span financial years. So we're working on structure plans, as you well know. Um, it just wasn't one completed in that financial year, but they overlapped years. Um, just working through the others. Um, yeah, so again, if you if you're looking in the detail, we have a measure around um, our support for um, events. Again, COVID environment, not yes. quite as many events undertaken, as you're aware. Um, Hopefully we're through that now. Um, so that's the key reason for that one. Um, visitors Splash Planet um, wasn't open. <laughs> so again, a reasonably obvious explanation for that one. So that, that's a flavour of what was coming through there that's sort of led to that sort of performance stat. So there's probably reasonably legitimate operating reasons for those. Yeah. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, my second question through you, Chair, is on a uh, note of customer service mystery shopping. Um, and I guess, you know, the um, we're down 2021-2022 as a result of COVID and being able to provide the level of service that we wish to to the community. Um, a note there that says uh, this is being followed through, um, more detailed information. Uh, how, how will we get the report of what has been followed through and that detail? Uh, well, I can follow that up for you um, if you want to see the detail of that. But as I understand it, the customers were quite complimentary of the service in these cases, but had requested more detail than they'd received. And so that's something the team's looked at 
um, for those particular requests. They're quite peculiar to those requests, as I understand it. So if you want further information on that, I can't give that to you now, but I could certainly get it back to you. Um, Greg and the team follow, follow up um, what comes out of these mystery shops quite rigorously. So. Great, thank you. Thank you. We have two recommendations on page eight. Could I have a mover and seconder, please? Thank you, um, Councillor Redstone, and a seconder. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Lawson. I'm going to put those uh, that recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Now I need to um, cast you backwards again because actually I began the meeting in such a fit of enthusiasm that I neglected some, um, some items. So first of all, we have apologies and leave of absence. So we have apologies received from Councillor Ollie and Councillor O'Keefe, and also um, an apology for lateness from Mike Paku. Um, and do we have any requests for leave? There being none, I will um, put those um, apologies. Do we have, thank you, Councillor Kerr, and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. And I also neglected to um, mention to you about conflicts of interest. Um, I expect you to respect those in the usual way. And then to item four, which was the confirmation of minutes from our last meeting, could I have a mover and seconder? Thank you, Councillor Dixon. And a seconder, please. Thank you, Councillor Harvey. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. And now we'll resume normal service. So moving to item six, I'm going to ask Mr Hanson to come forward, but I just do want to preface that with some remarks. So we... Mr Hanson is going to be talking to you about our water programme, which has been the most significant capital works program in the history of our council. It has been long, it has been expensive, and it has been involved. And the fact that we have committed to it so totally is out of a sense of responsibility to our community and our desire to ensure that our community is at all times safe. I want to uh, further add that we have carried out this program in some of the most alarming and catastrophic times uh, in the last two centuries. We've been dealing with a global pandemic, a European war, and sundry other things which have resulted in significant price escalations. The best way of thinking about escalations in these environments is thinking of it as a total percentage of the, of the total project. So it has been an expensive project, and in fact, what Mr. Hansen is talking to you about is in the vicinity of a 10% overrun, which in the environment that we all find ourselves in with global inflation, 10% um, is in the order of things that we have come to accept as, as the norm. In terms of how we're going to afford this, again, the times that we have found ourselves in have meant that many of our capital programmes have been unable to be completed in the time. So in order to finish the water project as part of the commitment we have made to our community, we are able to do this without additional funding. It is just a reprioritisation of our earlier set priorities. So that said, I'm going to hand over to Mr Hanson now. If I can, through you, Chair, before we hand to Mr Hanson, I haven't got oh, sorry. much further to add to a very good summary, um, Chair. Um, but worth reflecting on that, um, you know, last month was the sixth anniversary of the Haplock North uh, water crisis. And, uh, you know, following the inquiry into Haplock North, this council committed to a drinking water strategy through the long-term plan in 2018 was and continues to be our number one priority for our community, where our community, if I paraphrase it, said, uh, would you just get on and do it? Um, and we have over um, a, a number of years um, been running a program that has been a mix of upgrading all of our drinking water network, rebuilding our main trunk lines, our booster pump stations, upgrading eight small uh, community uh, water supplies and our two big urban projects. And uh, I think uh, 
Graham will talk to um, elements of that program, but it is a program that has been going for six years. Um, pleasingly, as we head into the completion of the entire drinking water program scheduled for the middle of next year, uh, yeah, that the context that the Chair said is right. We have been, particularly over the last um, two years, um, dealing with some pretty um, challenging cost uh, construction price uh, inflation uh, and all of the normal things that go with, as I'm sure Mr Hanson's going to touch on, uh, the processes around finding sites, uh, sites that have um, uh, resource consenting processes and appeal uh, sort of processes. So many things at play. Um, but today, just to reinforce, is to um, bring the council up to speed with the um, programme its um, forecast completion, its forecast total uh, cost at completion. Um, it is bringing you up to speed. It is not seeking uh, a funding decision. We are not um, asking for any additional um, funding, um, but rather that this has dealt with within uh, the Capital Works programme that we have. But on those comments, um, I'll hand over to our Director of Major Capital Projects, Mr Henson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Chief. Uh, and good afternoon again, councillors, from uh, this morning's opportunity to present this project or the, a component of this project to you. Um, the actual paper stands on its own, and I'll largely take it as read and happy to talk through any elements of it and discuss the content of it by way of questions. But I just wanted to, and I've, I've been sitting there thinking over the last couple of weeks about how I reflect on the totality of the journey that we've had and the things that we largely forget pretty rapidly with a firstly a very diverse program over the six years but also the massively changing circumstances and the layer of um, changes and challenges we've, we've had. So if you indulge me for a couple of minutes I was just going to sort of step through those elements to remind us both how long ago some of it was, what the elements were but also in, in some respects the ongoing and cumulative effects of things. You know, we talk about things a couple of years ago and, and assume that's a couple of years, years ago as opposed to what's occurred or still occurring as a result of those. So I don't want to bore you with the history of the thing, but I do want to bore you enough with, with uh, this part of the journey to give you a, a broader appreciation. In fact, some of it you'll understand, but if you actually add them all together, you, you, you gauge the... Uh, the enormity of what we're dealing with, the unprecedented, unprecedented times and the cumulative effects. So I'll just sort of take you back to, at the start of this journey, it was budget set at a time that understood as much as they knew at the time of what we were going to do. We, were, we needed some water uh, infrastructure facilities. We didn't know what size, scale. We didn't know where. And so it was very much, I suppose, in one breath, a blank canvas about what are we going to do, where are we going to do it, and how are we going to do it? And I was sort of, the first note here was a significant issue that has pursued us, the word I'll use through this entire project, has been our challenge uh, to find where we can install this infrastructure. It started in the small communities. At this point, I just want to acknowledge and endorse Steve Cave's effort in that area that we've ended up with you know, state-of-the-art facilities in, in most instances in, in the middle of communities that you know, if I'm really honest, I scratched my head and thought, well, how on earth are we ever going to achieve that outcome? And that challenge has been all the way from, for those that can recall, the Havelock North Booster Pay Pump Station Cycle, the NIMBYism elements of this project, and its challenge every step of the way, right through to the large, two large big projects that we're referring to primarily in this paper. Um, and, and the challenges from this table around, you know, we were looking at St Alban Park, for example, with the Brimley project and the mayor particularly was uh, very helpful in encouraging us to go back and look at a park that was contrary to your initial perception was, was a godsend in terms of um, where this infrastructure should end up. Um, so, so I'll leave that thought with you, just the challenges of how many of these projects, we had seven small water treatment plants, a booster pump station, large pipeline contracts and then the two, two uh, major city treatment plants. If I reflect back to 2018-19 and sort of, in fact, prior to my time, budgets were set in what <laughs> I was reluctant to call it, what were more normal times, whatever they are and whatever they're going to be. But it was more realistic in those days that, you know, budgets did reflect something that you could hang your hat on and hopefully with reasonable experience and a degree of confidence. 2018-19, which I suppose was the first of the um, poor alignment of the moons, 
Um, we had a very buoyant economy in, in New Zealand, if you can remember back there, and it was red hot in Hawke's Bay. Um, so much so that there was certainly a lot of private sector work that at best there was limited interest in what we did and there was a lot of challenges around you know, our lengthy processes, our formal tender processes that we were um, bound to step our way through, particularly with the major works and, and to a significant ex extent appropriately so. But we were competing in an environment where major contractors said they had no, they'd been involved in no formal tendering processes in a two year period. So it was, while we were a major player in the game, we were, we were at a time where there was plenty of other work, not of the size and scale, but they were making the same amount of money. And the example, and I won't mention the contractor's name, but the example was in our three-month tendering period, they would pick up three or four jobs, not of an equivalent size, but of a size that would keep money rolling through, keep the business going. And, and not live in a space of saying, well, if they were unsuccessful, then they step back into another lengthy process. So that's been a challenge for us all the way through. We've exploited or tried to exploit the range of procurement approaches available to us, direct engagement, open tender, invited tender. We've had success in each of them in their own way, but they've all been massively impacted by the state of the time in each, in each one of those. And our experience certainly through that 2008, 2018, or 2019 and 2020 where we released the big components of work. If you can recall, all of that came back to this table and we had at best one tender in most of those. So we were really being held, not, not held to ransom. That was the reality of the time. It was a matter of finding someone to do our work at, at the cost being um, promoted by way of those tenders. We then, so, so Fortuitously, in 2019, we released a, a contract somewhere within the realms of a budget for the small communities. We were very fortunate at that time they were able to buy all the containers, all the component parts of those. And while we are still finishing the last of those, those costs were locked and loaded in that late 2019, early 20 period. So we're suffering a little bit of pain, and hence the figures are quite small if you look at the small communities. So we're picking up the cost of contractors still being with us and dealing with you know, the cost of more the contractors rather than the component parts. <coughs> Step into 2020, we then decide to lay over that extremely busy economy, extremely busy Hawke's Bay, <laughs> limited market in Hawke's Bay, a global pandemic. That culminated, and I'll, I'll just step you through one scenario that's in, in isolation seems relatively manageable, but you'll appreciate just how, in fact, it's still affecting us today. So if I go back to the Frimley project, which was 20, early 2020, we went through an extensive consent appeals process that the net result of that delayed us by six months in terms of starting that particular project. Not the end of the world in a normal world, um, but the challenges immediately started that we were attempting to build a, a large-scale water treatment, complex water treatment plant in the middle of winter. We'd never intended that, so uh, significant costs were added that we had to build a plastic village over the top of the thing so that we were able to pour concrete in the middle of winter, as an example. So these are all not insignificant costs. That was $25,000, $30,000, but we ratcheted them up in each component of the phase of these works. We then were able to release through, if you can recall, the early days of the um, um, when we weren't working, that we were able to play our essential services card and get some of the um, contractors released and, and back into work in the Frimley project. Having said that, we then had to pay a significant amount of money to open up a concrete plant. So while we got the work done and we stayed on time in some of those elements, they came at significant costs. And that sort of flavour flows all the way through this. You know, we were late getting the floor poured, we were late getting the walls up. You can recall, I think, the story at the same time concurrently, we had reservoirs leaving the UK that were fortuitously a couple of weeks before the Suez Canal ship, if you can remember that, so we got it through the Suez Canal. We could track it a bit like a plane thing on the screen. It got to Malaysia to be told, Malaysia's at 140% capacity. There's, we have no guarantee how you're going to get it to New Zealand. We won't offload it and promptly watch the ship on the screen head back toward the UK and back to Taiwan. And they unloaded it in Taiwan and said, well, they've got more chance of finding a New Zealand ship, in fact, an Australian ship in Taiwan. And so, therefore, you know, that was a two-month delay. We had specialists from out of town that built those things here. We're paying standing charges and all those sorts of elements. 
That flowed through the whole component parts, but the roof for the Frimley Water Treatment Plant, ordered 14 months ago, committed out of Australia, available supposedly three weeks before we wanted it, to be then told because China had shut down, the steel hadn't got there and we didn't have a roof. So we spent another $25,000 putting a plastic hat on top of the plant to allow the component parts inside to continue. So, and, and so that's tracked our way all through that project. It's the same contract, contractor, if you can recall, that we bulk two treatment plants in a pipeline drawn into one large contract, trying to encourage a bit of um, large-scale competition, which we didn't achieve. But what's transpired is they're, they're now late onto the Eastbourne Wairoha site. And so as you look out there, while it's a massive hype of activity, it's also a massive headache. So we've got four contractors trying to operate, operate on a site that was always intended to be staged of tanks would be finished, the water treatment plant would start, the ball would go in, and we, we now have all of those players on site. Um, they're playing exceptionally well together at the moment, but it is high risk. We have seven metre concrete panels going up in the coming weeks that is one and a half metres from tanks that other guys are working on, and that we have to bring in specialist trains and plant now to stand that sort of gear up. Over and above that, and you're all well aware, and I don't intend to spend any more time on it, but the actual cost increases have been eye-watering. It's the only way to, to describe it, particularly the most expensive elements out of the Northern Hemisphere. Not only is it, is it expensive, it's been delayed because of that. We've opted to, uh, in fact, not opted to, we've had to fly in component parts. So $3,900 transport costs on a ship are suddenly $24,000 that are needed. Not all of them, but some of them are needed because they're poured in concrete that have got to be installed at certain times. So, you know, something that appeared to be only a few weeks of effect uh, at the start of what was the um, start of the pandemic is still actually impact, impacting us and will continue to impact us right to the end. The contractors here are desperately short of resource. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've talked about, and, and you've seen it recently in the last week or so, about the building and civil sector has the highest uh, mental health and suicide um, position at the moment, which is not you know, an unenviable position, but that's the reality of what's occurring out here. You've seen some of the concrete pours that we've started at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm. I wouldn't say flouting our consent conditions, but obviously outside of our normal consent conditions. But you'll appreciate that those concrete places, they start at 3, they finished at 9 for us, That'll be a day's work. They have something to eat and they head to another job. It's a, you know, an unsustainable um, experience. Similarly so, steel places, concrete, concrete places. In my experience in the past, it's been if you miss a, miss a gap or you're not ready in time or miss an inspection, you simply roll it to the next day, roll it to the next week. These things, you wait six weeks and you take the chances. And of course you've got six weeks of having to pay those costs, those standing charges and whatever. So it's, like I say, I've experienced elements of those over the last 40 years individually, but never in my wildest dreams would I expect to have seen them accumulated or cumulative through particularly, particularly 2019, 2021, now 22. Mr so Hanson, happy to leave the I was going to say, I think we all understand the complexity of the situation that you've been working with because although it's been um, more traumatic from your perspective, <coughs> you know, we've all been part of that world too. So thank you very much and thank you for your passion. Mm -hmm. um, just one thing before I hand to councillors for questions. I just want to acknowledge, Graham, you know, you and your team because the context in which we've been operating has been um, pretty amazing. And my couple of little um, anecdotes that just give life to some of the examples that Graham's Talk to, I recall, turning up at four o'clock in the morning in Frimley to watch the concrete pour and saying to Graham, God, that laminate timber that we're using for the, um, for the boxing? And, and Graham said, don't give me our time. He says, look, it's the only timber that we've got available. We've got 40 concrete trucks backed up here for six hours. And if we didn't use laminate timber, because there's no boxing timber available, that then I can't get any more concrete trucks for eight weeks. So don't give me a hard time about the, <laughs> the laminate timber. Right through to, um, you know, we were due to um, be commissioning and opening in Frimley in July. Um, 
you know, and then the things that China went down into um, complete lockdown, where the LED lithium batteries were coming from, I was like, well, why can't we fly them? Well, yeah, good idea, but you're not allowed to put lithium batteries on planes, you know, it blows <laughs> yeah, them up. Exactly. So it's just been all of the way through some really complex challenges. But the last point I wanted to make, and it's in the paper, is worth reflecting that, mm. you know, but where we are at today, you know, all but Whakatū finished in terms of our small community water upgrades. Whakatū will be done the side of um, Christmas. Um, you know, Frimley is in commissioning and will um, open the side of Christmas. And we have um, Eastbourne Waiaroha left um, in, in, in terms of working through um, to to the end of the um, to the middle of next year. But you know, we we are you know substantially through this this program of work that has been our biggest priority for. Um, our community. Thank you, Mayor Hazelhurst. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, can I also acknowledge you, Graham, and your team? And uh, when I sat through a government water inquiry in 2017, and here we are today, uh, having ticked off the seven small communities, two town centres, uh, and Flagsmere Town Centre, three, three, and the city, um, I'm incredibly proud of what we have delivered. And to hear and understand the price escalations, the logistical nightmares and the challenges of around um, accessing materials. Uh, I'm incredibly proud that we have been able to do what we have done in the time that we've been able to do it. And when I, nobody knew what was in front of us with uh, all of these challenges of COVID and, and, and the fact that uh, we added some new communities to our strategy and so we added Tipahui, another $800,000 for a small community. We added Waipatake, another small community that has safe drinking water. And when I, uh, uh, Councillor Barbara and myself went out to open the Waimarama drinking water, uh, new drinking water, and we saw that for years that community had struggled in the peaks of being able to have safe drinking water for a community, and you saw what this infrastructure could deliver for small communities. Um, it's, it's absolutely significant and it's life changing. I mean, our council received a $14 million grant from the Crown uh, and there was a leadership grant to help us along this journey post Havelock North. So with this, I see that um, this isn't a shortfall, this is actually an addition to what we first started off when we first signed off on a strategy in 2017. I'm very grateful that our council's in this place today that we're not starting, like many councils in New Zealand. Mm. We know that there will be uh, three waters reform across New Zealand, uh, across councils who haven't started on their uh, upgrade of their drinking water strategy and their plants. Uh, and we, are, we can hold our heads up very proudly that uh, we've got on and done what we were meant to do. I'm very happy to move the recommendations. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, Councillor Shollum. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Your Worship. You've actually covered a lot of what I was hoping to say. Um, so I would just like to thank Mr Hampson for the comprehensive report and also the explanation that you've taken us through, as well as keeping this council informed along the whole journey. Um, I do feel we have been informed. Um, I will ask three questions, which I already know the answer to, but I think it's important that the community hears those. Um, so my first question is, is there any way to complete what we have set out to do uh, without reprioritising capital works, without this extra money? No. Oh, no? <laughs> Thank you. That was the answer I was expecting. Um, my other one is, will it be any cheaper if we delay? No. No. No, on the basis that um, the commitments we have are contractual commitments we already have in place. So this is a bit about just delivering what we're already committed to. Um, Unfortunately, there's, there appears to be evidence in literally the last one or two weeks that there's, there's potentially a bit of heat coming out of the market into 2023. It's a little cold consolation for us, unfortunately. Thanks for that. And my final question is, um, given the pragmatic suggested approach, which is a reprioritisation of already planned capital works and debt that would be incurred for those capital works, is there any other debt to be incurred if we proceed? No. 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 So thank you. So what I see this as is a proposal to complete a project we're committed to for our community without incurring additional debt, um, in which case I am very happy to second the recommendations. Thank you, Mayor Sandra, for moving them, and thank you for your work. Thank you. Councillor Nixon. Thank you, Chair. 
if there's one project this council has been involved in in my time that I've been totally behind, it is the upgrade of our water uh, systems. I was one of the five and a half thousand people that was very ill mm. when I was infected with Campylobacter. It was a very unpleasant experience. Some people didn't survive, as we know. Uh, I was uh, here when we uh, had the issue of the Havelock North pump station. I was deeply involved and, and strongly resisted the effort to, to um, put tanks on uh, the St Alban Park. Uh, and, and so it goes on. But the one thing I would say about this project, one thing that stands out is I can't remember anyone in the community ever having a go at me over it. And, you know, this is about the only thing I think we've done that that has happened as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so, and nobody's, nobody's complained about the cost either. People say, get it done. That has been the, the story from the outset. So I can't second it because that's already been done, but I do strongly support it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Redstone. Oh, thank you. I didn't realise I was next. Um, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to acknowledge Graham and Steve Cave for the really good work they did with um, communicating with our communities um, over the changes that were going to happen in their rohi. And I just honestly can't believe how easily we got through that. Uh, there were some big changes. There was a lot of community input, particularly in a couple of the small communities. And I thank you very much, Graham and Steve, for, for the work you did and I fully support the recommendation. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Barber. Yeah, uh, kia ora tato. I see uh, back on the uh, 8th of April, we, we approved an additional 6.8 at that meeting. Hey, that's the Yep. Yep. Um, so uh, this 8.7 uh, would... It would be a total of 15.5 over the original budget. So this is uh, the, the, the last budget we were working to is 82 and is an 8.7 um, uh, you know, uh, addition to complete the program across the um, program elements with a uh, degree of um, certainty now and that we have um, you know, contractually um, you know, got all the pieces in, in, in place and the last uh, major element was uh, the process that we've been through with Gemco in terms of early prior, you know, early contractor involvement, um, the lock, lock, lockdown fixed price for the <coughs> build of the uh, education centre at the Eastbourne um, site. So um, this is the projected final programme cost for the completion of mm. the entire programme. You know, you know, I understand inflation and um, the cost of uh, and availability of you know uh, everything that's been said today. Um, but you know, just just highlighting the point that we did we did have that hui back in two thousand one, and we did uh, we did uh, throw uh, six point eight million additional money at it, and uh, we are coming back for another eight point seven. So. We do live but in not, it. notwithstanding that, you know, I, th I think it's it needs to happen. I mean, we can't have a half half cooked project uh, out here at the, at the front. So, um, yeah, kia ora. Come on. Thank you, Councillor Watkins. Well, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think in the history of Hastings, this is a moment in time people will look back and say the council made a huge commitment to its community. And challenges came from all directions, and we never wavered. And we never said we're going to call a halt or we're going to slow down. We made a commitment after a terrible event. And we've kept that commitment, and I think people will look back and say, there was a council who in a moment of time stood up before the community and delivered. And it's, it's you and your team, Graham. And I was there at three o'clock on that morning in Frimley for the first pour. <laughs> and, and it's something I'll never forget. Probably one of the highlights of my time around this council table. A, the beginning of a huge in, infrastructure um, development. So 
I'm sure, and I've heard everyone here feels proud about this, and I'm sure our community feel very proud too. So, fantastic, and very happy to support the recommendations. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. And just uh, we have an, a similar sized pour occur occurring out here, and the next week or two, and uh, an option will be for all of us to get on barrows and do it to save a bit of money, perhaps. <laughs> 60. 60 truckloads is, is, a, is a fair volume, so appreciate your comments. Thank you, Councillor Corbyn. Thank you, Chair. Um, I support the recommendation, and I also want to acknowledge um, Graham and Steve's work in all of the water projects, particularly the non-urban community projects, uh, which were Though smaller, they were significant and make a big difference to those communities. Thank you, Mr. Paku. Uh, I'm also in support of the recommendations and, and congratulations to yourself, Graham, and Seaman and the team uh, to, to undertake any development during COVID. I take my hurdle to any to any uh, anybody who's finds themselves in that position. Um, well, I do have a question. In some regards, so I appreciate that we have captured some of the smaller communities and improve their, their, their water, drinking water supply. But we also still have a number of other communities, especially Māori communities out there, like in Pakitahoke, Bridge Park, et cetera, et cetera. Will we be able to capture some of that within the uh, proposed three waters space? I'll make some opening comments through you, Chair, and then end to, to Mr Thu. I think consistent with the direction that we've been given by um, Council, we... Um, we still have a lot of growth happening in um, Hastings and we know that we have got a number of um, communities um, that are um, being really clear about their aspirations, Bridgepa, Wamahu, Te Hauki, and the direction that we've been given and this will be coming back to Council um, is for, for uh, the Council after the 8th of October to make some decisions around what um, investments they might want to make um, ahead of uh, the three water entities being stood up, um, but certainly a lot of the work that we're doing is to understand, um, you know, those, um, prioritise those, what will it cost in terms of investment, and to bring that back to council to make um, those decisions and certainly be um, well well prepared to either advance it through council whilst we're still in charge of three waters um, or to position very strongly uh, for their delivery um, if these new water entities go ahead. Thank you. Did you have anything to add, Mr. Thew? No? I think the boss has covered it pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Councillor Kerr. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I just need to acknowledge the difference that having great water in the communities of Waipatiki, Whiranaki, and Tepuhui has made. So thank you, Graham, and your team. And also thank you today for talking us through the history because there were things you reminded me of that I had completely forgotten. And that comment that someone made, the, this is not um, extra money, this is act actually extra water. These are extra things that we've added on to what we originally budgeted for. I thought it was um, so well said. So thank you. Happy to support the recommendations. Thank you, and I must say, for me personally, coming to the end of my time on council, the association with this water project has been one of the most satisfying things. And I can remember early um, in my tenure here, in fact, Mr Thew has never let me live down the fact that I described the pace of our progress on remediating our water situation as glacial. And so every time we've had a significant progression on the waterfront, Mr. Few says to me, so not glacial then. <laughs> well, emphatically not glacial. Well, in fact, we have, we have global warming at the moment. Such is the progress of our water project. So it gives me great pleasure to put those recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you, Carried. And I'd just like us to show our appreciation to the, for the work that Mr. Hanson has done. Thank you, Mr. Hanson. You can you can go and spend some more money.
Now, we have item 7 on our agenda, which is our draft financial end of year results for the 30th of June 2022, and I'm going to ask Mr Wilson to come forward. I hope that's not moment. <laughs> um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is the um, financial result for the year end, um, as at the 30th of June 2022. Um, just a couple of comments on that. It's been a really, really interesting year, as you all know. Um, it's been challenging from the point of view that you've, you've had COVID mostly in the orange, um, which has affected a number of uh, community-facing facilities. On top of that, you've got um, conditions of the that's been mentioned here already at, at this meeting with the inflation um, effects, the um, escalation in prices all feeding in, um, and, and uh, the issue of getting resourcing in order to actually be able to complete those um, projects. Just wanted to go um, because we are presenting two lots of accounts here. This. We have the statutory reporting, which is the annual report, and that is what is published, and that is what the auditors um, go through. That uh, is the annual plan, but does not include brought forwards of $51 million, for instance, from uh, the prior financial year or any other adjustments, whereas the management reports that you see in your dashboard are the ones that we present every quarter um, in this meeting, and they actually include all of the revised budgets with the additions of, of carry forwards, et cetera, et cetera. The rating result is really all of those activities that we've rated for and what that result um, is coming, uh, what, what that result comes out, how much we've spent, um, and, and you know whether we've got that surplus or deficit. Just going to this, this um, graphic that you see here, this is the um, statutory reporting account. So the annual plan budget there has got nothing in it but the annual plan. Does it not have the carry forwards or any other adjustment that's pure? That's what they, we're required to do by legislation. Um, and so as you can see there, um, we'll go through the operating revenue and operating expenditure in depth because I've got, I've got uh, slides for that. Um, the big move, movements here in terms of a pure accounting result uh, around the gain or loss on revaluations, um, which were around that 549 million actual, which was an enormous uplift. That uplift was primarily driven by the three waters revaluations. Um, we're still waiting on the final reports to come through. But just to give you an idea, the, the, the value of the assets in, in waters last year was 671 million. Uh, with this revaluation, it's gone to 1.05 billion. Um, and um, obviously, the, the uh, effects over two years of since we last had it revalued uh, around um, the price escalation and contracts, um, a lot of that stuff's driving that. We will have more detail once we get the, the detailed report on that. The other one, uh, we didn't have to do transport revaluation, but we did because the uplift was so great that we needed to uh, keep that in whack. Um, that, that transport uplift was also contributing. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, just because of the hail. Oh, talk closer to the... Right hand side. That's about, uh, Chair, the, the amount of our water that? revaluation of our water assets was? The water assets uh, revaluation uplift was $382 million. Total, take, takes it up to a total of $1 billion. Yes, right, so the assets you. have gone from uh, $671 million to $1.05 billion, um, which is that uh, water side. Can you... Hear me? Yes, uh, that, thank you. Know? you. Oh, I will lean forward. <laughs> uh, the, the other one, as I was saying, was the transport uplift, which was a $167 million movement as well. So both contributed massively to that number that you see up on that screen there. Um, the other um, big movement in there that's pure accounting, um, an accounting um, result is the unrealised movement on swaps. That was a gain of uh, $11.9 million this year. Um, purely driven by the fact that, of course, we locked swaps in a number of years ago and the interest rates have uh, gone up significantly um, subsequent to that. Just going through um, to the operating revenue, um, so taking out the all of that extraneous um, accounting speak, if you like, and that's just going to actually what happened in our activities. That operating revenue was uh, $7 million unfavourable to budget. Um, main drivers around that uh, were subsidies and grants at $9.3 million unfavourable, um, partly due to the fact that subsidised expenditure in the Flaxmere Developments and also in Waka Kotaki um, weren't completed. So when we do complete, we will get the money uh, that will roll through into the 22-23 year. Fees and charges, of course, were severely hit in terms of revenue because of Splash Planet shutting down. Um, that was a major impact um, as well on that. Offsetting that was um, an increase in vested assets um, received of around $4.5 million. Operating expenditure, um, which was around $3.6 million unfavorable, uh, favorable to um, budget, sorry, uh, due to lower personnel costs, um, savings and finance costs, and also other operating costs. Um, what you'll find here is, is that while uh, COVID had an impact on the uh, community-facing facilities, it also had an impact on the expenditure side as well, and it shows out in these numbers. For instance, Splash Planet's personnel was down, so were a number of other issues. Um, resourcing uh, with the number of vacancies rolling through were also across various activities were also um, impacting on that number. Um, and so even the expenditures, operating expenditure side starts to show up in some of those capital projects and why we never managed to complete some of that. So all of these, um, even, even the operating side actually starts to feed into an overall picture of, of, of the outcome that we have. Um, yeah, so the the offset to that, in addition to that, finance costs were $1.6 million favourable, and that contributed significantly to the rating, uh, small rating surplus that we had. In terms of the uh, whole of council uh, capital spend, uh, we had, I think it was $160 million worth of budget in there, which included carry for prior carry, um, Bought forwards from the prior financial year. Um, the actual spend was 90.6 million. Um, the, I, I guess the um, interesting thing around that, and you'll see in the carry forwards that we've recommended to carry forward into next year's budget, is that the meeting that Council had in late May allows for a more flexible structure. Um, the asset managers have worked around that and repositioned and realigned the priority projects. Um, if a project starts to fall behind, we'll be able to pull one forward and take one out. Um, um, and so um, that should be um, a good outcome. The other thing to remember here is with all the restrictions and um, issues that we have faced, $90 million is actually probably not a bad outcome um, when you're looking at um, you know, the resourcing and supplies. Just drill down into that a little bit further. 
Um, what you've got here is that uh, capital spend against budget by growth, um, renewals, and also um, the new works. Um, obviously, growth can be problematic in the sense you're relying on a number of other stakeholders, um, external to council as well. Um, however, I do understand that um, their contracts have been let for um, um, Howard um, for the external work, so the progress is expected there in 22 23. Um, so that'll be good. The renewals is around 76% of actuals against budget. Renewals are probably one of our most important um, types that you see there because it's our assets that we're, we're looking after rather than bringing new assets on um, as well. The third one there is, is the new works. Um, oh, and just one thing on that renewals, the, 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 one of the drivers of underspend was the wastewater in the wastewater area. That was a fairly chunky um, um, part of that and around um, the retendering of one of the larger projects and the tendering release of another one in September of this year. Um, and the new works, of course, included the drinking water um, spend, which you've just heard of. And, um, of course, there's, there's um, a chunk to go in terms of that as well. Madam Chair, may I ask a question of this slide, please? Um, through you. Um, Aaron, just to clarify, we've budgeted the orange bars. Yes. We've spent the blue bars. Correct. Will in this next 12 months we spend the balance? No. So that what we had budgeted to do within 12 months we'll have caught up? Oh, sorry, that wasn't supposed to be. My apologies. Uh, so what will happen is that the vast majority of that underspend there is in the carry forwards into, and being factored into the budget in 2022 uh, And I think just if I can make um, some comments through you, Chair, you'll recall it's, it's not many years ago, um, you know, 2000, up until 2016, 2017, the annual capital spend of this council was about $40 million a year. Uh, we've been progressively building that off the back of our drinking water um, program. You'll recall that part of the challenges and why we had the conversation in May is we also were very successful over the last two years in that you know, over $50 million of external funding came directly onto our balance sheet for housing infrastructure, for drinking water infrastructure, for $10 million worth of roads and uh, footpaths. So we've just increasingly carried forward more and more money. So we've been doing record levels of capital spend, but the, the problem, when you had $90 million of new capital and you carried forward $70 million, we were never going to do $160 million in one year. So the conversation that we've had about going... How do we have a multi-year capital program with some more um, flex is very much the direction that you'll set. So whilst we'll carry forward money, it's about having a more multi-year view of our capital program instead of the singular, let's just carry forward everything and think we can all do it in one year because it's just not That's um, right. the way that this, um, it's, not, it's not best practice. Yes. And I think we're moving increasingly more and more into that, that space, but off a you know, a consistent level of capital spend now that's in that um, sort of $90, $100 million uh, a year. Yes, that's absolutely true. Actually, I don't have too much to say on that slide. <laughs> um, but that, that, that was the point I was about to make, was the capacity has been slowly built over the years, and I think I was looking back 12, 13, something like it, it was the wall of $38 million. Um, And so that, that's what that slide does show, is the increasing um, internal um, build capacity and experience. Um, external debt, of course, is the other side to an increasing capital spend. Um, and what you see here is our external debt uh, gross is sitting at around that $237 million. Last year it was $205 million. Um, it's very much in line with the LTP within um, the Treasury metrics, which I'll show you shortly um, as well. Uh, and also... Uh, that 237 jump represented just one single borrowing amount, which was 32 million almost uh, in one hit we did. Um, and that we have sitting on our balance sheet at the year end. And that was for capital spend in the current year, preparation for capital spend in the current year that we are in now, 22-23. Just looking at the debt by type, by activity, um, what you can see there is um, there's quite a widespread 
But when you look um, a little bit closer at the, the three waters and you add the, um, the, the water supply, the wastewater, and uh, the stormwater, you're looking at around 51% of that number. Um, when you when you convert that, you're looking at around 120 odd million dollars in actual numbers. Um, yeah, so I, if I can, Aaron, you might be about to touch on this, but also in the forward year and what some of our borrowings are for, there's also significant upcoming investment in three waters. So yes. Eastern Intercept, you know, there's another 10 million of that 30 yeah. million that we've capitalised for in terms of the work that's getting underway this year, and again, it's three waters uh, related. Just moving through to debt measures, because I like to put this up as well when debt's big. Um, people like, do like to see that the Treasury policies are being followed and the metrics are being followed. So what you have here is the debt to income. You may remember about um, a year, a year and a half ago in the middle of COVID, we actually moved that top one from 150 to 175, um, which was agreed. Um, we have the interest to income and interest rates there. They're well below the metrics um, uh, uh, that are showing. And liquidity um, is usually in a range between that 110, 170. We traditionally sit between 116 and 127, 128. Um, so we're pretty much smack where we, where we normally are. And that also takes account of the facilities we have on hand, which is 15 million, plus the uh, 32 million uh, that we had on the bank at that time. We spent a chunk of it in the first three months. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> Through you, Madam Chair, please may I ask a question on that previous slide? Can you please explain the professional advice we get around these measures? Because if it was us setting our own measures, we can make them suit yes. what we're trying to do. Yes. So I'm really interested in the professional advice. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of factors there, probably. One is around... Um, you know, Bancorp have a meeting, a professional meeting with us every month, and three advisors come to see us in terms of Treasury and review our Treasury every month. They also annually, when we review the Treasury policy, uh, input into that quite heavily. Um, and the second one is around what is acceptable in terms of local government and audit and what they require as well. So it's, it's fairly, you know, it's, it's driven by those factors. Just as an aside to that, that first, um, that first uh, metric, if you like, that 175, the LGFA, which is the Local Government Funding Authority, which we borrow from, um, that was in some cases in, in, in some councils, I think it was up to 300%. So um, we're relatively conservative and, and um, a lot lower than, than some of those in terms of that. Now, the rating result. The rating result um, was $571,000, and that was split between rating area one and rating area two that you can see there. Um, looking at, um, you know, uh, uh, rates revenue of $95 million, that's 0.6 of a 1% um, um, landing strip. Pretty tight. And can I just say, Aaron, though, and through you, um, Chair, I mean... Um, I'm so proud that we are presenting a rating surplus because all year I was signalling that I did not think we would be able to uh, present a rating surplus and um, you know, we've worked collectively hard to uh, manage our costs in a year that has been pretty challenging with, with lockdowns and impacts on uh, revenue. So whilst it's not the biggest um, surplus, the fact that we have a rating surplus in both RA1 and RA2 uh, is something that I'm incredibly um, proud to be uh, along with my finance colleagues and uh, Mr CFO presenting to uh, the council as the draft uh, result for the year. Um, and through you, Madam Chair, I think it, the report talks through three options, um, primarily for the allocation of that surplus. Um, our Treasury policy talks about, in the first instance, repaying debt. Uh, so we're putting, we put that up there um, as an option for consideration. Uh, and, and obviously, um, a logical component for that would be um, the debts associated with our Herakonga House uh, asset. And um, so that, that's an option, um, contributing some money to our contingency reserve. Um, and that's really just acknowledging, again, the uncertain times that we're in, um, the inflationary pressures that we have um, on the organisation and the um, continuous sort of 
stream of opportunities that arise um, for Hastings and, and, and for us to take advantage of. Um, and, and, and thirdly, um, an opportunity to put that to Council's um, general purpose reserves, and we have one for each of the rating areas. Um, the reason for the general purpose reserve really is there to cover off um, those eventualities should Council deliver on a deficit, because if you think about uh, these are rating results, so, this is, so at the end of the day, if we had a rating deficit, um, we need to fund that deficit somehow. Um, the way things have panned out, rating area two does have a reasonable um, general purpose reserve balance. Um, the rating area one, that's very small, that was utilised um, last year to fund the rating area one um, deficit. So uh, that that's there if, if, if we need it. Um, you know, in years gone by, we haven't been that tight that a general purpose reserve sort of drawdown has, has been important, but um, that's the reason that we have those those reserves in place. Um, you'll see in the recommendations of the report is actually given given all of these uncertainties that we have uh, currently that the recommendation is that the $571,000 surplus is allocated to the contingency reserve um, and then we can look at um, should there be opportunities for that, uh, whether that's through cost escalations or, or other opportunities that we can take advantage of that. And uh, that, through you, Chair, um, these, these are all choices for you as the councillors to make. Um, what I would um, acknowledge is, as a council, you set um, a, a pretty tight brief for your community through the last annual plan process, which is we are not going to increase our rates beyond what we set in the LTP. Uh, we have some uh, cost pressures that we're having to absorb within our budget, but I'm also conscious that you continue to be a really ambitious council for your community, and there are things that do come along that I know will be important to Hastings next year that weren't provisioned for in the annual plan. And so, for example, um, I know that we're at the early stages of this, but Hastings turning 150 years old um, next year is probably quite um, important. So um, I just think when you think about those three choices, um, you know, the contingency um, is for contingency, but it is also for, um, in the context of um, new opportunities that also um, come along, but three legitimate choices for you. Thank you, Councillor Scholler. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you for the explanation. I, I think the thing I'm, a, I'm curious to understand more is if, if we do allocate the surplus to the contingency reserve, whether there, uh, what, what is the process around accessing that reserve? How does that, that go about? Can, can you take me through that? Um, for, for minor allocations from that reserve, generally it's operated with under the chief executive's delegations. Um, if there was to be anything of um, more significant materiality, and I'm not quite sure what that number is, um, then we would be bringing that through to council. Like we've done previously with things like um, the COVID recovery conversation that we had earlier this financial year, and we talked about um, how that was going to be funded in the allocation to the contingent of, from the contingency reserve um, for that purpose, but. For low level, um, small items, generally, it's, it's within the Chief Executive's delegation. Um, I'm sorry that this question's only just come to me now, otherwise I would have flagged it with you earlier, Ms. Allen, because I'm really keen to understand what that figure is. I, I guess my concern is, um, while I absolutely understand in the current environment we're in, especially with inflation the way it is, in order to achieve scheduled works, it may well be we require a contingency, um, as you say, Chief, to, to deliver without imposing a rates increase on our community. But I'm also really keen given the fact that you know, families throughout our community are feeling the pressure of increased cost of living and inflation themselves. Um, I, I want to sh demonstrate that this council's been really prudent with money. And so um, my knee-jerk reaction to this is that um, debt repayment feels better unless there's real surety around that contingency reserve not being dipped into, and I'm sorry, I can't find a better way of phrasing this, dipped into the, for things that aren't of absolute necessity to the community, especially in a time when they're already feeling the pinch. So um, I do apologise for not thinking of this question earlier. Otherwise, I, I know you could have come prepared, but I'm just wondering if there's any way to sort of find out a little bit more about that to give me um, a little more uh, comfort if we allocate funds to that reserve that it's going to go to the important things, not frivolous things. Um. I, I, frivolous is probably not something that we would look to um, <laughs> no. fund. Sorry, um, wrong use of the word. But. 
But I think the, the key thing, so the way we generally operate with the contingency <coughs> reserve is, is throughout the year we'll make um, allocations from it or commitments um, from that reserve. And we don't necessarily draw those commitments down unless we have to at, at year end. You know, if, so in this situation, with a $571,000 rating surplus, um, during the year there had been small co commitments made against the contingency reserve because we had an operating surplus. We were able to absorb those commitments into the into the result and not draw down on the contingency reserve. So we do we do treat that contingency reserve as the real contingency. It's it's a it's almost a fund of last resort. Um, should we need to do that on the way through? So, but I can get some more information on it. It's not completely answering your question. Um, and I'd have to go back and find some more information on that for you. Sure. Um, I guess the, the other thing I'm interested to understand is kind of the history of that fund. So, uh, and again, I do apologise that this has only come to me now. Um, I, I would challenge that. I think this is exactly the subject, Councillor. Well, I think we'll I think we'll just have this question answered, and then <clears throat> Mr. Allen has undertaken to come back to you with some more information. So and we'll so let it lie. The yeah. question that I'm interested in understanding, um, Chair, just to inform my decision making. Otherwise, I'm going to be in a situation where I have to abstain. Is um, is there any money in the contingency reserve right now? And do we have a history at all of um, having a surplus in that contingency reserve that we then maybe allocate to debt funding? Later, I, I, I'm trying to understand if we allocate into that, is there an opportunity to maybe bring it for debt if we don't require it for contingency? Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll you chip, I'm missing anything. Um, um, so, the contingency reserve was created um, as a reserve only a few years ago. Prior to that, it was a budgetary amount which then got carried over from year to year and year and built up over time. The last time it got significantly drawn down was in response to the Havelock North water event. Um, okay. It got completely, um, excuse the pun, drained um, <laughs> in, that, in that process. So yeah, that's, that, when we talk about contingency and, and the real reason for having something of this nature, it is for those events. And, and typically supporting other smaller initiatives that are unbudgeted um, that council would like to take advantage of during the year or cost pressures or escalations that may come along. Um, and it just provides, um, I guess, the opportunity for council to keep going with initiatives, knowing that there's a funding mechanism beyond the budget should it be required. Uh, I think if I can give you one another example of something just recently, um, we're doing a, um, an IT um, installation um, that's coming in approximately about $50,000 over budget. Uh, it's important that we do that extra work to complete it. Um, the contingency has been allocated to it as a means, as a backstop, to enable that work to continue this financial year and get the work done, uh, acknowledging that it's going to be overspent because of a number of reasons. Um, so it just provides that, that, I guess, that confidence and assurity that we can can complete projects and create opportunities as they arise. Right. Thank you. That gives me much greater peace of mind understanding it's earmarked really for those big things. Thank you. And I think it's worth noting that when, if three waters proceeds, that will remove approximately 40% of our debt, which puts a different complexion on things as well. Mayor Hazelhurst. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair. First of all, um, congratulations to the team for a surplus um, in this very, very challenging time, as we've heard, uh, the cost es escalations on all our infrastructure projects. Um, I I'm happy to support the recommendations uh, and... I think it's, it's worthwhile for Council to know what the contingency reserve currently looks like. I think that's a, an important question for councillors to understand that so they can make an informed decision. Um, and uh, so, so is that likely that, that you can come back to us with that sum yeah, of money? Yeah, I can tell you that now. I mean, the, the current contingency is 1.4. Uh, 1.2 million, right. 1.2 million dollars. Okay. Um, so again, to put this in context, and as you, as you know, um, we we work hard to try and be prudent, stay over our um, costs. Uh, the, the the challenge is, as we've said, it's not just infrastructure; it's all the costs at the moment. It's our contractor costs. It's our own staff costs. So the annual the, the approach we've taken historically um, has always to be. Um, to find the cost of salary increases within our budget. Um, this year, to put it into context, the average salary movement across all of our staff was nearly 5%. Um, 
Um, that is the market labour market conditions at the moment. That, that cost of $1.7 million is not in the annual plan that was adopted in February. We're having to find, to find that to maintain our current staffing level, so um, whilst the contingency at 1.2 might sound like a lot, and the reason that we have a contingency is to deal um, you know, with, with things that you genuinely need to have contingency for. Now, this year, um, you know, and again, whilst we're presenting a rating surplus, I thought we would might have to call on the, um, you know, the contingency that we had. We've been able to manage our costs this year that we haven't called on the contingency, and we've delivered a, a rating surplus. But in really tight um, sort of times, you know, the, the last thing as a chief executive um, I want to be doing, and you probably don't want either, is um, turning up and saying, oh, hey, we've got a rating deficit and you're going to even need to fund that from debt or next year's um, rating impact. So having a prudent level of contingency, I think, is um, yeah, pretty, pretty sound. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief. Um, and through you, Chair, just a follow-up, please. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to move the recommendations. I would like to understand a bit about the landfill because I'm not across it while we've got this opportunity. If somebody um, could just explain to me about the project, about that surplus of landfill going into the development, uh, where we're at with the costs of the development um, of that New Valley in the landfill. Oh, thank you. Through you, uh, Madam Chair. So, um, councillors will be aware from earlier Ops and Monitoring reporting, we have our consent now for the New Valley, um, which is great because they're quite rarefied um, to get a consent for the landfills currently. Uh, the team are at this present time proceeding um, with the assistance of the Major Projects team on the, the detailed design of the New Valley. Um, and we're taking the opportunity with our contractors going in there also to do some of the earthworks as part of the BAU. Um, the f um, work will kick in um, in anger once we finish a few more um, consent tick-offs of um, things we need to do in terms of pre-construction pre monitoring for baseline monitoring. Um, and it will start um, in the next financial year with the building of all the, the stormwater and the, um, the silt retention um, devices. Um, and then, yes, it is a multi-million dollar, multi-year project that we need to have completed um, and, and is fully provisioned um, in the future year. So um, it's well in train and um, dirt will start to get moved and, and um, whilst um, the municipal building and those items in that capital program will drop off, the landfill will kick in as quite a substantive um, investment project. We are looking at how we can stage it though so we don't have to overcapitalize too early. Right. Um, and there are some interesting challenges coming forward in terms of the cost for landfilling, given the taxes that our, our community will be paying will be significantly higher than that. But we're just looking at how we can cash flow it out as best so, as possible. So how much is in that reserve, Ooh, the landfill sorry. reserve? So uh, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but we right. can come back on that one. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, so the 1.2 um, surplus, you'll require this for this, this project that you're going to commission next year? Uh, yes, and it will just reduce the amount of debt we need to take on. We can delay when taking that debt, so therefore okay. save save those interest costs. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sears. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, just to, to clarify, um, please, Bruce, the contingency reserve we've discussed, and there's $1.2 in it, the Council General Purpose Reserve, which is actually what's recommended in this paper, is for rates deficit. Is that correct? Or by so, um, so, yeah, so the recommendation <coughs> is that we, we use the funds go into the contingency reserve. Oh, to the contingency. The, the, the reason we have a general purpose reserve is that should we have a, a, a deficit in the future, those general purpose reserves are used to fund that deficit. Rating if you deficit. don't have if you don't have a rating if you don't have a general purpose reserve, um, as Mr. Bickle talked, you either fund it from debt short term, or yes, yeah. you don't have any choice. You need to then fund it from future rates. Um, yes. And claw that, claw that back. back. So, what's the balance, please, of the um, general purpose reserve? Uh, yes, rating area one is about twenty-five thousand uh, dollars. It's actually so I've got the actual numbers if you want those. Um, Nine point three thousand dollars in RE one, and six hundred and twenty-eight thousand dollars in RE two. <laughs> Thank you. So, just a comment. May I make a comment on that now, um, Chair? Uh, I, you know, I, I see the the Treasury um, policy. 
that um, surpluses are applied to reduction of debt, and, and it makes perfect sense. And you understand that the Treasury would always offer prudent um, use of those, and it seems to me it is very prudent at that time, while having surpluses attractive in times of trouble, so is reduction of debt. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me it's the right time for our community to see us reducing debt, because in a way that's also um, a way of protecting us. So while it's not the recommendation, that's probably what I would support if that came up as an option. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, look, I'd like to second the recommendations. Um, I think it's probably, it's, I'm very pleased with the surplus, uh, and I think at this particular point in time, it's very prudent to have some uh, extra money in our contingency fund, so I'm very happy to second the recommendations. Thank you. We have a mover and seconder. Um, I will put those recommendations. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Thank you, carried. Thank you, Aaron. I can continue. Yep. Oh, that's all right. Against? Sorry. Thank you. Oh, we can. Good. <laughs> that's good. Um, this is just a, um, a statement that, um, just to let you know, that on the 5th of September, the Rural Community Board um, agreed that the, um, the allocation of the RE2 general rating surplus be aligned with the overall allocation um, as per this um, committee. Um, this one here was just a summary, if you like, of of the reserves, uh, the um, sorry, the surpluses, the rating surplus, and the landfill surplus, um, which shows that 1.278 million there, um, split between the, the two. Yep. I'll move on with that. You're happy with me to move on with that? Yep. Coming forward, coming on to um, the carry forwards, which is the other uh, piece of business that this. Um, this needs to be done with, is the $74 million worth of carry forward. So you can see the growth funded, $22 million there, the rates funded of, of, of $1 million, and the loan and reserve um, funded carry forwards of around that $50 million mark. Um, just to give you an idea, the 22-23 budget started life out at around $82, $83 million. After that meeting subsequent in May, um, we pulled that budget back to 65 and re realigned um, some of the projects in there. Um, that's to make room for uh, this chunk of, of um, carry forward. And um, that's with the new flexibility as well over the, the two or three years, um, we'll align those um, projects accordingly. Um, and and as, as well as that, of course, the, the growth funded one, we always bring forward because you never know when that's, it's, it's a lot different, more difficult to predict that, that one rather than the uh, loan and reserve funded one, which we've a lot more control of those projects. Yeah. So with that, the question is uh, with the recommendation relating to that carry forward and whether, um, are there any questions with that as well? All good. And that's my slide, is those questions. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, just before we move on, I just wonder if we could have a, a report on our COVID recovery fund through you, Madam Chair, uh, on what we've spent, what we have allocated, and what we still have left. Um, I think this is very relevant when we talk about um, the wellbeing of our community at the moment. Thank you. You mean at some future date, or did you think someone had those figures? Oh, we probably meetings? haven't got that that information on hand, so if you could come back no, to No, we, we don't have that on hand, unfortunately. So if we could come back to the full yep. council with an email, thank no you. Problem. Thank you. Councillor Shalom. Um, if I can just extend on what Miss Sandra's just said, because I absolutely endorse that. Uh, can we have it, whatever comes back to us, encompassing the whole time of COVID? So we, we've... We've had a few funds that we've we've allocated over the period of COVID and just interested to understand the outcomes of the projects we funded and just a bit of reporting coming back around that. Yep. If I can, through you, Chair, um, I think uh, we'll, we'll probably resend the earlier reports we did because we have done substantive reports back against the first COVID recovery um, you know, uh, programs in, in 2020. Um, so if you're comfortable with that, just probably re, re refreshing you with 
the stuff that's a couple of years ago, but but more than happy that we will come back quite quickly with the you know the last COVID recovery um, plan that you signed um, off on. Um, bearing in mind that we're just coming to the tail end of a couple of um, major elements of that, you know, Apple's project, um, mm -hmm. obviously the Blossom um, Festival uh, next week. So over the coming month, we'll, if, if you're comfortable with that, we'll do a report against the COVID recovery plan for 2022 and then just resend the previous evaluations against the through, earlier COVID recovery. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, sorry, just to clarify, it's more the, the things I was interested in from the past and the things that were ongoing. There was an augmented reality um, uh, service that we funded through the arts recovery COVID part of that. That was ongoing. We haven't had that reported back. So not so much stuff we've already had, just things that are rounding out what was outstanding. That would be great. Cool. Thank you. Item 8, which is the Regional Economic Development Agency update on establishment, and um, our CEO is going to speak to that. Yeah, so um, information um, paper that I'll take is read. I just wanted to draw a couple of things. Obviously, the decision to establish a regional economic development agency was a pretty big decision for this council alongside the regional council and the other three territorial authorities in Hawke's Bay. Uh, the decision off the back of the Section 17A review uh, that was completed uh, that um, talked about uh, you know, the need to establish a regional economic development agency, focus on in industrial um, sector um, development, um, traction of um, you know, capital being investment um, ready, not not doing, uh, I guess, canvassed well um, the reasons why previous iterations had um, perhaps not been successful over four different versions of this through the 21st century. Um, where we're currently at, so it's, it's been a very dynamic process with our partners um, because it is uh, 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 premised on uh, councils alongside our um, Iwi Mana Whenua partners and our business community. But where we're at today, and I think the important points I'd make, is uh, Matariki is the starting point for this, which is our partnership for both our economic and um, social wellbeing. Um, we actually had to go back to some of those principles to be able to move the reader um, forward. But um, the key, key elements are uh, Matariki will um, do the appointments of the directors to the board. Um, the entity is, is in effect a subsidiary of Matariki, that Matariki sets um, the KPIs and the, the outcomes. The um, process where we're currently at is we are moving to have the company and the constitution completed by the um, end of October. The key elements of it is it's a um, shareholding across um, the partners, a third um, of the shareholdings held by local government, a third by um, business, and a third by um, Iwi Mana Whenua that reflects the partnership that we have uh, at, at Matariki. Um, the questions that have just been worked through with our Iwi and Mana Whenua partners is they give um, uh, expressed this through um, an entity called TKO, but they're not an entity in of itself, so who holds the shareholding for Iwi Mana Whenua is being worked through, and in the business context, business and um, we have said also in the business context, there's a there's a multi business component, and they're just working through uh, that shareholding, and then we expect in the coming uh, week to be advertising for the directors, um, the paid directors of uh, the regional economic development agency. We have agreed that that's a skill based um, board. Um, the board um, we have a um, a board appointment um, panel that's been constituted that reflects the partnership. Um, Mayor Hazelhurst on behalf of the councils um, across the region, um, a business um, a representative, a Māori business representative and a mana whenua representative. Uh, they will undertake the board um, interviews and make recommendations to uh, Matariki who will sign off on the board appointments and we expect to have the entity formed and the board appointed by uh, the end of the calendar year, um, but in all likelihood, um, you know, by the time the board's in place and then appointing a um, chief executive, that will be in the early part um, of 2023. But happy to take any questions out of the report. Councillor Harvey. Yeah, thank you. Um, you refer to shareholders. Uh, are all parties financial contributors? 
No, um, the, the starting point, obviously, to start the Regional Economic Development Agency, the $1.7 million um, has been the commitment across the five, um, the five councils. Um, as, as you'll recall, Councillor Harvey, um, certainly the old business Hawke's Bay had both a mix of council and um, other funding sources. Uh, so I think that what we're seeing from the partners is saying um, not ruling out um, <coughs> making uh, you know, a financial um, fi financial contribution um, in the future, but we need to get um, started. And we've um, consistent with the reports that came to council said um, the best way to express that, whilst it's being the 1.7 millions come from the five councils across the region, um, to um, have a have a shareholding arrangement inside. Um, the entity that reflects the partnership across um, local authorities, business, and Iwi Mana Thank you, Councillor Dixon. Yeah, thank you. My question was similar to Councillor Harvey's. The quantum required to run this on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. You said five or seven million. Oh, one point seven million 1. is 7 the million. is the investment that's gone into um, the standing up the reader, which is intended to not be a large entity. Uh, that's very much deliberately focused on having a CE and a small number um, of staff that's focusing in on the things that councils agreed off the Section 17A review, which is about strategic industry and sector development. And um, you know, if I refresh the major findings out of the Section 17A um, review, as if the Regional Economic Development Agency gets into the business of um, you know, industry or membership organisations, we will have probably... Um, fail again, that it's not there to replicate um, the, the services that um, industry organisations like Chambers of Commerce and business associations perform. It's very much about advancing the region's um, sector and industry and infrastructure development for our long-term economic success. And is there any thought about proposed locations or where they're going to establish themselves? Uh, yeah, so um, thank you for that question, Councillor Dixon, because that's probably the other salient point out of the report. So what has happened, um, with a degree of surprise um, from the position of the McKims earlier in the year, the McKims have basically given notice to uh, the business hub in Ahuriri and said uh, you need to be out of those premises by January, um, which um, has just thrown a, a, an added dimension to getting the... Uh, Regional Economic Development Agency established. Uh, we have agreed a process. We are clear of what the requirements are. Uh, we have collectively um, signed off and engaged the property group, and we are going to run a process that basically identifies the sites. We are being... Um, uh, uh, proactive, but we're also being, um, to, to a degree, um, agnostic, not trying to make this a bidding war. I guess the history... As much as I understand it, and Mayor or other councillors that were around at the time, I'd like to comment. I don't know that there was any major rhyme or reason to how the business hub ended up in Ahuriri. We tried to be really clear on what are the requirements. The really pleasing thing is all of the agencies um, that are hanging together want to stay together. The moment that we see a fragmentation of regional business partners, Callaghan, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, we will never get them back into a co-located um, space. So we're, we're clear on what the requirements are around premises, car parking, what the elements of a business hub needs to contain, and we're going to run um, basically a transparent um, sort of process around um, that, that decision being made around what the next location is. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Kerr. Oh, thank you. Um, can you please tell me who is on the Matariki Governance Group? Yes, the Matariki Governance Group, as it stands today, is the uh, regional chair and four mayors. The uh, nine, nine or ten uh, iwi mana whenua partners across Ngāti Kahanunu, the Taifenuas, and the post settlement groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have, and you know, this is the dynamic space we're operating in. We'd always had uh, the district health board representative. Um, so trying to work out, well, what does that look like in the new um, health arrangements? The other issue that's being resolved, and I really want to acknowledge um, the fantastic leadership of Alistair McLeod, is that since the demise of BHB, what we haven't had is business sitting around the table. Everyone acknowledges that business needs to be sitting around uh, the Matariki governance table, and business are currently leading a process to determine how we get 
um, business representative representatives back to uh, the Matariki governance table. Thank you. And through you, if I may, um, just a follow-up question. I'm really interested in um, the reporting back and the methodology that um, all of this information will be reported back. I'm not sure if it's going to be like this on a regular basis, whether we get copies of the minutes, whether we're issuing statement of intents and getting annual reports. Yeah. Yep. So in the first instance through you, Chair, um, we're expecting a monthly report to all of the councils who are funding the establishment of the reader in terms of the progress against standing the reader up. Um, once we obviously have a um, board in place, um, the expectations will get set through um, the Matariki governance, but we will need to have a process that each of the councils feed into, um, obviously shaping uh, those, those expectations for uh, the Regional Economic Development Agency. Thank you. Mayor Hazelhurst. Um, thank you. Um, my my uh, question was along the same lines as the uh, Deputy Mayor. I, um, I'd like to um, have an action that the Matariki minutes or the Matariki um, update is included in our operations and monitoring report mm. um, across all the work that the region region's leaders are doing. That would be uh, really helpful. Um, my, my other comment really is around um, trying to uh, fit out and find a purpose-built building ready to go for, uh, for um, the business hub uh, is, is, is unfair um, expectations, I would say, in terms of we, we watched how long it took to fit out the business hub in Ahuriri, um, and, and we were part of it. We used to visit it uh, as a council. And, and um, I'd say it's almost impossible to stand something up in three months' time. So I, I wonder if there's the opportunity to go back to the landlord and, and ask for an extension? Yeah, and the answer is an emphatic. No, you will right. be out in January. Okay. Wow. All right, then. So, um, so, yes, it might be a temporary site, but um, I find that to be very, very hard to find something that's ready to go at this point in time and been able to get a fit out, office fit out done. Hence, hence why we've done a lot of work collectively and we have our um, team through Raul and Craig and Lee supporting um, this work. The property group have been engaged. We've provided um, you know, a number of sites that are possible in a Hastings context, both as temporary and permanent locations. Um, I would imagine that um, uh, in reality, with all due respect to our um, our most northern and southern neighbours, that the business hub is not going to be located in Wide or or um, Central Hawke's Bay. It will be in either Napier or Hastings, or even a potential to have a presence in both Twin Cities. <coughs> and that is what this process that we have underway is designed to do as quickly as possible, recognising that January is not far away. I think the pleasing point that I just want to reinforce is we were quite nervous about... Um, you know, our tenants' reaction, because the tip we have many from the Chamber who now administer the regional business partners contracts, mm -hmm. New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, Callaghan uh, mm -hmm. Innovation, uh, the tenants are saying they all want to stay and move together, which is really, really pleasing, because that's the biggest risk that we run, is if everyone fragments that we will never mm -hmm. um, get these tenants back together mm -hmm. again in a, um, in a shared business hub space. Great. Um, good luck, and I look forward to finding suitable premises. Thank you. Councillor Shollop. Um, thank you, and uh, thank you for that update. It is really pleasing to hear that these entities are wanting to hang together, and I hope we can facilitate that in some way. Um, I will be looking forward to in the future once things are a bit more cemented uh, with the ADA, uh, understanding how reporting will happen on a regular basis. But in the meantime, I'm very happy to move the recommendations. Thank you for the update. Thank you. Do we have a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Watkins. I'm going to put the, the, that recommendation. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Now, just before I close the meeting, we do have an informal after the close of the meeting. Um, this is our last operations and monitoring meeting for this triennium, and I'll finish with a karakia. Um, just before we finish with the cut of care, can I acknowledge your chairmanship, uh, Councillor Travis, um, over the last term of three years and the very efficient way that you've managed our operations and monitoring committees. Uh, and, you know, we've delivered an awful lot in hearing today 
the extent of that delivery program, um, 94 million, then 90 million um, over a very, very challenging time. I thank you and the staff for very, very satisfactory and um, successful meetings and acknowledge that this will be your last time in the chair, but coming to the end of your time as a councillor, I acknowledge your hard work and support you have done for, uh, for your community. Kia ora. Thank you for that. Um, and sorry, Madam Chair, um, on behalf of the staff as well, um, thank you. We've been a pleasure to have worked with as the officer responsible for this um, committee. Thoroughly enjoyed the last six years, I think it is, that, we're, um, that you've chaired these meetings um, and really enjoyed um, working with you. So thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Right. Kua mutu a mato mahi mō tēne wā manakitanga mai mato katoa o mato hoa o mato fano ai o ki te aurangi. Amine. And that translates as our work is finished for the moment. Bless us all, our colleagues, our families. Peace to the universe. And I declare the meeting closed. And we'll just move to our informal item. Um, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, um, oh.